for another episode of Anthony Bates, and it is a continuation of the Northern Ireland theme. I mean, I'm interviewing people from all over the world. Why would I not be interviewing people from Northern Ireland? Um, but even even more oddly is I'm actually interviewing somebody from my hometown, which in the grand scheme of the world, it's probably about this size. Um, and all the more bizarre that he should be um, an absolutely world-renowned, international, successful uh, uh, coach and business coach and business person and pub and speaker and indeed author as well. Um, I, can we see it probably? A little bit okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, so he, he's the he's the author of Business Growth Lessons Learned from Divorce, Dating, and Falling in Love Again, and he's none other than Niraj Kapoor. Niraj, how are you, Anthony? It's an absolute pleasure to be in your podcast. And I'll tell you what, it was so funny when I found out we lived literally around the corner from each other for years, like literally a mile from each other. You know, literally, it, it, it is most bizarre. And isn't that the way it always happens? You know, you go across the world and you bump into somebody from next door, <laughs> from next door kind of thing. Um, really, really, really interesting. Um, this book, uh, Niraj, um, I, I've got to say, you know, when I when I first, you know, when you first when you look at the, the cover and whatnot, I did think, here we go, another Here's how to cold sell and how to you know how to get those how to get those sales up. But I've got I, I'm going to read a little bit out if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so it's it's actually just it's in the introduction, but it was at this point where I thought, oh, I need I need to speak to this chap. I need to get to know a bit more about him. Um, and it says, and it's most certainly not something I would have expected to find in a book. From somebody who's a, a life coach, business coach, you know, we're going to talk about hitting the bottom line a lot. Um, so if you don't mind, it begins with, the problem I have with women is that I have vintage champagne taste, but a pizza face. Therapy is unaffordable when your business collapses. So is eating good quality food. But that's another conversation. Now, that little, see that, just that little bit there. Now, there's a bit of typical Northern Ireland self-deprecation there, but I also, I do also identify there's there's a little bit of insecurity too. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the open, honest, raw, here I am. And it just sets the tone for the rest of this book, which is, it's, it's, it's personal. I mean, I feel like, truly, I feel like I'm kind of, I'm on a train with you and we're, we're, we're going through the country kind of thing. And you're just telling me your entire life. It, it, it's it's gorgeous. Uh, and thank you. Um, how on earth did you get the idea in your head that this was the book to write? My first book was called Everybody Works in Sales, and that became a bestseller. Right. After 23 years working in corporate London, that gave me the confidence to set up my own business. Yeah. And at the time, I was thinking, before I wrote the book, how do I stand out? Because... I have to compete with the best of the best. And sure. no matter how hard I try, I'm not better than the best. <laughs> I'm, yeah. getting, I'm very good. But I, I know who the top writers are in the world of business and sales. I am not that good or famous. So what I thought I'd do is I'd tell my life story. Hmm. And at the end of each chapter, there'll be a lesson you can learn. So I started off what it was like working in London in the 1990s in Soho with no mobile phone, no <laughs> fax machines to communicate, no internet, carpeted floors, no air conditioning in the summer, you know. And I told my life story and people were surprised because a lot of books about sales and business show off a lot. Yeah. I was mainly about the failures I endured in order to become successful in life. And I was successful for almost five years, but it took me such a long time to get there. And just for anybody uh, watching, when I say successful, I don't mean millionaire. Mm. I don't mean high six figures, just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about double the national average and triple yeah. and five times national average. Not what you're thinking of success. Right. Uh, me, so success. any dates I was planning with you are not off, nor <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> and that was it. And that book became a huge, you know, five and a half thousand copies for a self-published book book is almost unheard of that happens to me a few times a year so i was very grateful and my second book i just was called the easy guide to sales for business owners and it was just facts and figures you're going to a presentation look at this page you're negotiating go to this page it was all facts and figures very useful right nobody bought it <laughs> because yeah. there was no emotion there was no journey there was nothing to take people on it was a good book but people just there was no word of mouth yeah and for my third book, I thought I have to go back to basics. But at the time, I, I wrote it as a novel. 
So there is a novel available, which was really good. But I thought, how am I going to sell this? It's not just writing a book. It's having people buy the book. Yeah. At the time, I thought, I'm not, who am I going to sell this to? And I started to really grow into a big name on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? I really got to mix business and pleasure here. Forget the novel. Let's go back to nonfiction book. Yeah. And let's tell my story. And at the beginning, it was incredibly emotional, but very therapeutic. Mm. Yeah, and I, I get that. I mean, um, you, you actually hit on a couple of trigger points there. So I, I gave a TED talk um, a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I, I sort of, for a few years, it was coming up, Anthony, do you want to do a TED talk? But I think you should do a TED talk. Um, but TED talks um, were, were kind of at that, you know, I was kind of looking at them and they all kind of, I was thinking, I don't want to stand on a stage and tell people I've done it, so can you. I didn't want to do that because that's that number one it's a lie um but number one it's a pressure it puts pressure on people you know so if i can do it everybody can do it or you must do it or whatever and i, I don't believe that's the case so i i i i, I really troubled with the idea do i do a ted talk do i not do a ted talk so i did a ted talk but i did a ted talk based on my failures the things that went down that led to the next step right um and I remember thinking, ooh, is this the right thing to do? And then you record it because it was a studio TED Talk. I recorded it and sent it off. And then I spent the next whatever amount of time waiting for it to go live, sweating blood, petrified, really, really scared. Yeah. Um, but the feedback that I got from so many people who said, I needed to hear that. I needed, I needed to hear about, number one, um, the successes that you had. That's great. But also hearing about the normal life stuff that was happening behind you and the trauma uh, and, you know, the Northern Ireland, typical events and things that were happening and personal stuff. And it made me realize, actually, we have come through a time where you're supposed to be able to just manifest anything you want. <laughs> yes. Watch The Secret, read the book. I'm sure you'll be a billionaire, right? Um, <laughs> 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 right and you just said something else there about success so i remember i made a tv show back in the uh, early 2000s sold all over the world um went on tour for about three years performing at um venues such as like uh, the odyssey in belfast we were at the nec in manchester earl's court in london big 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 successes um and there were times in that when i had a few bob and there were times when I was at red carpet parties and didn't have the taxi fare home. Mm -hmm. But I was successful because I was bloody happy, Niraj. I was having a ball, right? And I, I kind of want to ask you about that because you just said success, but I'm not I'm not I'm not, not a multimillionaire, I'm not a billionaire. What what is what does success look like to you? I love how you get that long story before you ask that really brilliant question. That's super. Uh, get you nice and comfortable. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm just qualified as a barrister, right? So I'm using <laughs> I'm taking you into a cross examination. Now you're dead. <laughs> I would say, I think a lot of people will get this. Success yeah. is waking up every day. Yeah. And doing something you love doing. I call it living on purpose. Mm. Um, so, for example, every day I wake up and I go into nature and I walk for half an hour with a soya flat white. To me, that is just a lovely start to the day. Mm. I then come home and I spend about half an hour helping people on LinkedIn who are struggling. I then will do one-to-one -one coaching and help somebody who doesn't quite know how to sell properly. Then the afternoon, I'll spend time with family. I don't really work much in the afternoons. For me, it's family time. Yeah. Do reading as you can tell i'm a big reader mm. and then in the evening i'll go back to work and i'll give talks at events and i'll really push myself so hard to speak and especially in america which is very competitive or canada i'll talk either about sales linkedin or especially at women's events i'll talk about vulnerability and how i turn my life around and i'm always pushing myself and then in the evening i'll rest with my partner and we'll just relax for about an hour before bed with some chamomile tea and junk TV. And yeah. to me, that's living a great life because it covers work, it covers charity, it covers love, and it covers serving other people. Yeah, lovely. Um, I've got to say, um, when I, you know, reading through the book, I mean, obviously, we, we get to hear about the lovely Orla uh, at, at the end. But reading through the book, I can see this journey, you know, um, and it, 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 it came across to me as a, as a kind of a, 
I can't be validated until I can make till I can find somebody who loves me, who wants me, who needs me, or or, or whatever. Um, and I and I thought about that, and I thought about the Northern Ireland upbringing, um, and then you know obviously Eurasian upbringing as well. Which, by the way, that combination for people who aren't from Northern Ireland, I can't tell you that. For, you know, we we're talking about queer forty and people who find them find themselves quite often on the edge or, you know, or being very niche. You couldn't have been more niche mm. if you were the first wheel. I mean, I grew up in the same town as you. We didn't have diversity. I mean, diversity was ordering something from the Chinese that wasn't rice and chips with curry sauce. <laughs> right, right, true. The Isn't number it? of people in our town that would go to the Chinese in order to take curry sauce was actually shocking. I'm like, <laughs> that's not Chinese, but you do realize that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, and that was as diverse as it got, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I, so I, I, without knowing your life story, I know your life story. I know that you will have found yourself quite often on the outside. Yes. And I wondered when I, when I was reading, you know, your journey and this, this quest for love, was it a quest for acceptance? Is it a validation? And is that driven from that sort of childhood kind of, of not feeling accepted? And then the second part of that then is, have, is that what has kind of harnessed your success as well? Because you you seek it in that in the business sense too. When you grew up in a small town like Northern Ireland, mm. which is very backward in many ways, mm. until the age of eleven it was fine because kids are kids. Kids just get on with you. Kids are yeah. really other when they're young, which I love. Yes. But when we get into high school, I went to Balmain Academy, which is one of the best schools in Northern Ireland. Yeah. But unfortunately, I spent the first three years, I discovered women. I'm like, oh, my God, this is incredible. <laughs> you know? And all the guys my age would be hanging out with other boys, like 11, 12-year-olds. I'd be talking to the 15, 16-year-olds, going, wow, you're gorgeous. Because yeah. I, that was what it was like. And I spent all my time chasing girls, playing music. That was all I did as a kid. Right. Because it made me happy. But obviously, my father was a very successful. And you know who my father was. He was a doctor. Yeah, yeah was local doctor, yes. Very successful, very respected. To have a son who is feeling horribly and feeling, when I say feeling, I don't mean getting B's and C's. I mean getting E's and F's. Right. Now, for an Irish person, that's bad. For an Indian person, that's a sin. I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's like the kind of thing you get held up for adoption for. You just don't yeah. do stuff like that. You know? um, and so he moved me to Antrim Grammar. And I yeah. think because I was a new kid, um, you know, the words that were used were deeply inappropriate. And we have to cut yeah. these from your show. I totally get it. But people start calling you a faggot. And people yeah. start calling you AIDS boys. Because yeah. in the 1980s, people didn't really know what AIDS was. Yeah. So because you're a new kid, that's what you know known as for the first year. And so everybody thought I was gay. And yeah. being in a small town was just nobody wanted to talk to you. Uh, anytime I talked to a, a girl, their friends and pop said, look, don't, don't talk to him. He'll catch AIDS. I mean, it was yeah. that stupidity and small town ignorance yeah and when i would talk to my parents about it they would say look just work through it you'll be fine mm. which is not an acceptable solution for a 13 year old boy you need right. an answer than that yeah a lot of things in school didn't make sense to me i was learning all these subjects like physics and chemistry and additional math thinking this is going to do me no good whatsoever in my life yeah. what am i learning this for yeah and i mentioned this to my teachers and headmasters they just tell me to shut up be quiet do what you're told i didn't like that i didn't feel i was learning anything of value yeah and i just wanted to fit in the problem was i wanted to fit in anthony but i knew i didn't fit in <laughs> so yeah I was totally compromising, I hitting myself for compromising and it was a very it's difficult enough being a teenager yeah. it's very difficult with your hormones and just trying to fit in being a teenager mm. but because i had so many conflicting views and so many horrible experiences i was either angry or emotional and just i, I found it very difficult yeah. And so acceptance was a huge deal for me. Mm -hmm. And when I went to England, I left Northern Ireland thinking, right, I'm going to show you people. I'm going to make something of my life. Right. And I spent three years working in a supermarket, which you know very well, called Stuart's. Yeah. Uh, eventually bought by Tesco's. And I did night shift. I worked Sundays because back in those days, Sundays was double time. Yeah. And I picked up thousands of pounds. I thought, right, I love music. I'm going to be the first Indian Bon Jovi. And of course you are. Yeah. Loads of demo tapes. Because <laughs> when you're young and naive, you don't know any better. You just yeah. don't know. Um, you have no idea how difficult it is. And I recorded demo tapes, actually yeah. cassette tapes. I went to Polygam and Virgin and EMI and all the record companies, and everybody said no. Right. 
uh, nobody really said to me you have to have talent and charisma and sex appeal to me. <laughs> you know, those well, are important. Listen, you know? it, it didn't work for me, Naraj. You know, I'm not a pop star. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that it was a difficult journey. Um, yeah. Certainly, the acceptance and wanting to belong has been a huge part of my life. Right. And the second part you asked about when I did finally fall in love after the trauma and heartache of divorce, right? Which was brutal. Um, it's not about acceptance anymore. It's about the fact that it gave me security. Okay. okay. And when I'm in a secure position, I go on to achieve great things. In the last yeah. year, I've achieved so many great things, but that was because I spent years doing all my dating and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. really searching. I was on three to four dates a week in Belfast. I got so bad that waitresses and restaurants knew me by name. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Kapoor, good to see you again. You know, good luck, yeah. right? You know, so, uh, <laughs> hope she turns up, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> yeah, I got so bad meeting in bars. I started just choosing really nice restaurants in Belfast. Thinking, you know what? If they don't turn up or they're a nightmare, at least I'm going to get good food out of it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. With chips. <laughs> <laughs> With chips and curry sauce. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I, one of the, the things that you had put in there, actually, you know, Northern Ireland being what it is, that, um, and I, I mean, listen, I'm giving it a bad press. It, it, it's really doing fantastic now, but. When we were growing up, it was a different place, right? Mm. Um, but, you know, that, that obsession of are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant? Um, and I remember somebody telling a joke about um, a Jewish chap walking up the Falls Road um, and the local heavies stop him and say, oh, I mean, you know, what are you doing around here? Are you, are you a Catholic or a Protestant? He says, oh, I'm neither. I, I'm a Jewish chap. You know, I'm a Jew. I, I'm not I'm not Catholic. You're either a Catholic or a Protestant, or you're a Catholic Jew or a Protestant Jew, <laughs> right? And I just thought, gosh, that really sums it up. And I imagine you probably would have had that same actually real lived experience where people would be like, yeah, okay, you're Indian, but you're Catholic Indian, Protestant. But wait, wait, what are you? What are you? It's interesting. When I was doing online dating, the first question women asked me was, what religion are you? Yeah. When I was dating on England, nobody asked me that. Yeah. In Northern Ireland, it's a big deal. They either ask you that question or they ask you, what school did you go to? That's right. So they can work out if you're a Catholic or Protestant. Yeah. And I was really surprised. And eventually I got defensive saying, well, why is that important for? But of course, yeah. Northern Ireland, sadly, it is important to a lot of people. Yeah. So growing up, I just never understood why people bothered me for. Yeah. You got your own problems fighting with each other. What are you fighting with me for? I'm not a, I'm not a fighter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I almost said I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. I'm glad I didn't say yeah. that. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a fighter. I, I don't believe in violence. I, yeah. I really don't. And um, really, it's so, it is very easy for me to say here and say, you know what, I wish we could all get along. And that's mm -hmm. what I believed as a kid. Now that I'm with a Catholic partner mm -hmm. whose family grew up in Derry in the 70s. Yeah. And I've heard some horror stories. Yeah about what happened i get i'm starting to understand why there's so much division i get it mm -hmm. but that's as, that's all i can say i don't mm -hmm. really want to get into politics at all so no it, nor do i and you know it's because we will never solve it in, 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 yes. in, a, in a 20 minute chat that's not going to happen right um but it, it it is really i mean i've literally just come up an interview there with uh brian kennedy before this one oh. um yeah so you know he he grew up in the falls um you know and he was talking about you know his catholicism and the troubles and then becoming an international pop star and then being gay and all of the different sorts of things and and northern ireland and I, I, it's not just northern ireland wherever you come from will always have a, a you know a big impact on that but you know it, it, it i think for anybody who has had to grow up in northern ireland not either a catholic or a protestant identifiable um I, you know i see you as queer as me effectively <laughs> right i really do because i know for a fact that there would have been a, a circle around that you know mm -hmm. um but going into the, the next side of it then so in business so i mean you've definitely i have no doubt you, you've had your knocks how did you use this then you know one of the things that i often say to people is don't stand and look at all the mountains that's happened in your life and, and try to climb them again you're already over them stand on them you know because um, that's kind of what I've tried to do. What mm. what what have you tried to do, or what 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 techniques or coping mechanisms have you developed? The best coping mechanism I developed was asking for help. Right. So after I was married for twenty one years, I mm. had an arranged marriage, by the way. So right. I'm 
20 minutes. Okay. And four days later, 800 strangers turned up at our wedding. It was the most terrifying thing of my life. She was 18, a very mature 18, and I was very immature 25. Right. Uh, and that was terrifying. But, you know, she's incredibly smart, resilient, determined, came to England with nothing. Mm. And within 10 years was a tremendous success. And that, in fact, just a very successful, very smart woman. But once our daughter went to university, the marriage collapsed. And right. I did utmost we both did our best to keep it together but we just couldn't it was over and then when i filed for divorce it just turned horrible and she went full throttle revenge on me and it was it was a horrible situation divorce is never nice no and after divorce i was very upset and bitter about the whole thing because the people i thought were my friends weren't they were my okay. friends mm -hmm. and i was left alone and then two two months later i thought okay i've got two months to, i'm gonna get my life together and then lockdown happened yeah and my client said, sorry, we have no money. So you're alone on lockdown. You're upset and hurting after a divorce. You're spending four months by yourself. No hugs, no affection, nothing. You're like isolated from the world. And that screwed me up very badly. And mm -hmm. I was really in a bad place. And I called my parents and I just been diagnosed obese by the doctor. Right. I really, my weight ballooned. I don't do drugs. Yay! I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I'm not abusive to people, but I just ate my way from two, three, four, five, six meals a day. Sure. And I ballooned to 18 stone. And I asked my parents for help, which asking for help is such a difficult thing to do mm -hmm. because ego holds you back, especially as a man. But it's such an important thing to do. And they were amazing. And they said, look, put everything you have in storage, come back home. And that's exactly what I did. I went back home for six months to heal. And how I got better was getting hugs from my mother. Because mm -hmm. nobody had hugged me, you know, for such a long time. It just, right. I just broke down when she hugged me because nobody, as a human being, we need a, some form of affection. Mm -hmm. If not from a mother, then at least from a dog or, just, yeah. <laughs> or a best friend or, or a granny or something, you know? Yeah. I didn't have that. It was really missing in my life. And then, of course, her home cooked food was outstanding. Indian home cooked food is yeah. the best not that chicken tikka nonsense you get in restaurants uh i'm talking proper home cooked food right that combined with my father who got me a gym membership because i didn't have a penny to my name and then said look i want you to go for walks every day it's very good for you i do it your grandfather did it it'll help you and he got me some books about philosophy okay socrates uh buddha philosophy greek philosophy about plato and you know it was fantastic and i think that plus being around my parents and then seeing my sister again and my nephews who I barely knew and reconnecting with them. My brother meant I was constantly around family. Mm -hmm. and within six months, I started to get better and I started to smile and I started to rebuild my confidence. Mm -hmm. and of course, when you do that in a social media platform, people start to notice. And I started writing about my journey, about how I lost pretty much everything, how I rebuilt my life, how I learned to forgive my ex-wife for the way she treated me, how I learned to smile again. And when I started talking about online dating, all of a sudden, everybody <laughs> sticking their nose in my business, everybody wanted to know. And I went yeah. from being a nobody to 2,000 followers, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. Then I got to 19,000 and LinkedIn gave me a top voice of the year award, which only 10 people in the world get a year. Right. Sales. I couldn't believe it. And nobody in Ireland has ever got this. Nobody in Northern Ireland has it. And that's yeah. a different level. So all of a sudden, I'm a somebody, but I'm getting recognized and respected by people. So that, in a very quick <laughs> summary, was yeah. my journey and my transformation. But yeah, yeah, when I start writing about online dating, and just say, for example, I'll be sitting up at a restaurant, Anthony, rather than just saying I go sit up at a restaurant, I have a picture of me having a meal, and the seat opposite me empty. <laughs> you know it's a very unpleasant experience, but I'll tell you what. In business, sometimes clients stand you up. Yeah. It's not what happens to you in life, it's how you react. So I try to turn those sort of personal, awful online dating experiences of yeah. meeting somebody going, Wow, you're ten years older than your profile, you know. And, yeah. Um, and try and turn it into as many business posts as possible. And that's what got me through. Writing is so therapeutic and talking mm -hmm. about your problems really helps you get through the process. Yeah, I, I've been doing sort of similar recently on LinkedIn as well, funnily enough. Um, so I, uh, at 43 years of age, got an ADHD diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden, my entire life made sense because I was able to go, oh, that's what that was. Um, 
But, and you know, and with that came a lot of traumas and different weird things that happened. But actually, a big deal, a big part of my success is actually due to those symptoms, right? Um, so it's not, you know, I think when you say, well, when you start to talk about having it, to me, it's not a condition. It's a brain function. Your brain works a different way. Um, but when you start to talk about it, I think people kind of kind of get a little bit, talking to somebody with a condition need to watch what I say um and I kind of my thing I think I want to do with that now is actually no quite the opposite be really inquisitive and whatever but I, I started to do posts on it and you know when you can see on the insights I mean the insights are getting thousands of so I know that people are looking at it yeah. very few people are willing to click like on it yet so um I've just qualified as a barrister um, and I've discovered quite recently um, with various interactions with top, top level barristers, um, two of which in particular, ADHD. Um, and, you know, they're, you know, they've been saying to me and, you know, trying to have this conversation is it's so hard. Thank you so much for having this conversation publicly and, and, and owning it. Um, so I, I totally get what you're talking about with that, you know, the using the dating in the business, because I'm trying to do the same with actually... Yes, there's crappy bits that go with this, but actually, you can really use this to your advantage. Oh, yeah, please do. Look, where, where ADHD know? is right now is where mental health was seven years ago. Yeah. Uh, mental health seven years ago, people were kind of aware of it, but couldn't really talk about it. But the more people that did, the more important it became. And now we have things like Mental Health Awareness Week. Yeah. And I really hope that if people like you keep talking about it, then in several, hopefully less than several years, we'll have ADHD Awareness Week because mm. it's becoming such a big deal. Now, I know so many people in the last six months yeah. have been diagnosed with autism yeah. or with ADHD. And when I say so many people, I'm talking hundreds, not yeah. tens, hundreds. Yeah. It's becoming a huge deal right now. So people need to be talking about it. And I think you're a perfect person to lead the way. You really well, are. Well, I'm, I'm prepared to go on it. Um, but one of the things that I was researching actually was life coaches and business coaches and stuff, you know, because I struggle too, you know. Um, really funny, actually, because people would often say, you know, I was a successful model, I was a dancer, a TV presenter, civil partnership, all these different things, Tip, very typically ADHD, loads of different big, big hits. Um, and people would look in and think, Bosh, you know, you must be so focused, you must be so motivated. And actually what they don't understand is I don't think I've ever felt motivated once in my life. Yeah. Never once have I woke up in the morning and went, today's a motivated day. I'm a motivated person. It's about kicking yourself up the ass, having a goal and deciding I'm not taking any less than that and doing the things to get there. Um, and so that's, again, another reason why I'm massively interested in you um, is because I, I feel that honesty with you, that you're not selling that kind of repeated, kind of rehashed, salesy sort of stuff. Yeah, because first of all, there's so much that stuff out there. Yeah. And when I became successful on LinkedIn by, by writing about my personal story, I didn't realize at the time. But what I was doing is I was standing out. So as a kid, you don't want to stand out. You want to settle in. Yeah. After the age of 40, you just care less what people think about you. <laughs> you just, yeah. You do, you and do, you so do. you kind of develop the confidence to stand out and not be as worried what people say about you. Right. And I love standing out. I love being different now. Mm -hmm. And what it's done is, what, what I love is every day I get messages from people who now are being different, mm -hmm. who have the courage to talk about their divorce, who have the courage to talk about mental health problems, who have the courage to tell their personal story because I did it. Mm -hmm. That's why I want you to tell your ADHD story because I know it will inspire so many people who mm -hmm. aren't quite sure if they just say it or not. Right. And it's one of the greatest feelings in the world, but I'm quite interesting as a male coach, about 70% of my clients are women. Right. And I always ask them, you know, why? Because there's so many female coaches out there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because there's so many passive aggressive men out there. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that's not me. Mm -hmm. And I'm authentic. I'm the real deal. And women get that. Mm -hmm. Women can see the journey I've been on because women are way more perceptive than men in most cases. They can yeah. see the journey I've been on and they're like, ah, I get this guy. Oh, mm -hmm. he's vulnerable. Oh, he was traumatized by his divorce. But you know what? He didn't speak badly about his ex wife. I respect that. You know, one of my biggest viral posts I ever did was when I went on my first ever holiday by myself for three weeks at a tour of the UK. Right. Uh, customers and to see one or two people I hadn't really seen for a long time. And of course, to see my daughter again, because she, she was in Australia um, 
uh, during lockdown. She was in an exchange program with Warwick University and Monash in Melbourne. So I hadn't seen her. Um, when I got to the house, my ex-wife had a new partner. Oops. And he was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's still with him. You know, he's like six foot tall, athletic, well in shape, still in box. Mercedes Jeep in the drive, like, oh, gee, and he earned six figures a year working in London, the city. So everything you didn't want the guy to be. I was, I really hoped he'd be a shorter, fatter version. That would make me really happy. I'm like, no, and I yeah. was devastated. Right. And I was on LinkedIn about it. And I, I said, I said something that people were very surprised by. I said, you know what? I am devastated. I feel like I've been ripped in two. I'm online dating. I'm getting my heart broken. She has men queuing for her. Right. But you know what? I wish her the best of luck in life and I wish her nothing but happiness because she's a mother of my child. Mm. And ultimately that's what I care about because my daughter lives with my ex-wife. I genuinely want my ex-wife to be happy despite how awful our divorce was. Mm. And I think a lot of women love that mm -hmm. because it showed maturity. It showed here's a person who's really worked on himself. Mm -hmm. and I really have had to work on myself. Yeah, And I'm just honored, really truly honored that I attract those kind of really positive customers and that most of the customers I have are just lovely people. They mm. really are lovely people. That, that's yeah. a, it's an incredible honor. Yeah. And I think that's gorgeous what you just said. Uh, one of the things that I do in my work as a lecturer is uh, critical reflection. So looking at Bezero and Gibbs, all the different models um, and, and trying to explain to students, you will never get to the levels you want to get to if you do not a engage critical reflection and be transformative learning. You know, so it's one thing to reflect and go, well, this is the good and this is the, what are you taking from it? Where's the tool? Why are you taking it forward? Um, and it sounds like that's how your practice is driven, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm a huge believer in that. Um, every day I write in a gratitude journal. Right. I write down, you know, what I'm grateful for. And that's really important on days that are very tough. Yeah. Because we all have bad days. Yeah. You have a bad day, writing down five things you're grateful for is a challenge, but it's very important. Mm -hmm. And then every Sunday morning, I'll spend an hour reflecting, okay, what did I do well this week? But what didn't I do well? What can I improve on? Yeah. And who can I serve and help more next week? And every every Sunday I do this. And it means that I get, I'm an incredibly self-aware individual. Mm -hmm. I know my good points and I know what I need to work on. And being self-aware is something more people really need to work on. Yeah, absolutely. And self self aware and fake confidence, of course, being very different, you know? Oh, absolutely. This whole thing about faking it till you make it, I, it's become so old hat now. Authenticity rules. Yeah. Be genuine rules. Don't be a genuine dick. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, well, I'm genuine. I said, no, don't be a horrible, genuine person. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you're not a nice person, don't go around saying, well, a lot of men, because I, I turned 50 last year. And I'm meeting a lot of men over 50 who are like, you know what? This is who I am. I will never change. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a terrible attitude. It yeah. really is because you've got to be evolving. The world has changed so much in the last three years, Anthony, more than yeah. the, last, the last 10 years. Yeah. You've got to be evolving and got to be adapting. The worst thing you can do is stay who you are and not grow or develop. Yeah, exactly. And you, you said about being a genuine dick. I had this scenario a few years ago. Um, I, don't, I probably shouldn't say it, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I still kind of work with the person loosely. Um, but this person said to me, oh, when you get emails from me, they'll probably feel really abrupt because, you know, I am a bit abrupt in emails. But that's just how I communicate um, and don't take offense. And I had that, do you know, what, 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 do you know when one second lasts for three hours whilst you're yeah. through a deliberation in your head? And I'm not the type that you'd be a dick to and do it twice, <laughs> you know. Um, so I said to said person, well, the very fact that you've identified that and you know that that's a problem, pray that I never get offended by one of your emails because that means you haven't made the effort to be nicer to me yeah. along those kinds of lines. Um, and it really took them aback. Um, and they, I felt, were quite offended by my authenticity in that scenario. Um, and that's the thing, isn't it? You know, I, there's this thing of if, I, if I'm authentically rude, well, at least I'm authentic. You know, no, 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 not OK. Um, but um, authenticity is something that I never, you know, going, going into the legal profession, it's something that I really struggled with because I thought I don't speak like a barrister, you know. I bet embarrassed to speak like this, you say. I do what I'm a lot. Um, and guess what? They don't. Some of them too. Some of them don't, right? Um, I'm gay and I thought they're not gay. There's loads. <laughs> I'm from a housing estate. So there's loads of those as well. And so on and so forth, right? 
um, and learning to switch off those those biases and I, I guess prejudices that we have about others in fear of them having about ourselves is a big challenge in itself to, to get to that authenticity, isn't it? You re- it, it does take a lot of time and effort working on you. Yeah. And that's why I'm a big believer in gratitude journals. I'm a great believer in reflection. Mm-hmm. I'm a great believer every day, turn your phone off for 20 minutes and sit in silence. It's one of the best things I learned. And I'll often sit there with a pen and paper and just write down my thoughts. And ha- really half the time, Anthony, I just, it ends up becoming a nap. <laughs> but it's a fact that I've turned my phone off. Yeah, right. You sit in silence and it's so important. Oh, everything is turned off. Mm-hmm. There's no way of communicating with me. Nothing pings. And that's those 20 minutes of silence a day are beautiful. Mm-hmm. But yeah, work on you, but also you know, read good books. It's not just, mm-hmm. you know, I, when people tell me to read The Secret, I cringe and think, oh, you poor thing. Because what the yeah. does is it tells you to visualize, but it forgets the most important thing, which is you have to do the hard work. You know? Yeah, the action bit, the action, yeah. <laughs> and people forget about that. It, you know, to, to do anything and to achieve anything in life mm-hmm. takes way longer than you expect, takes more mm-hmm. sacrifice than you think and often cost more money than you could possibly imagine. Right. Almost everybody I know who's an overnight success took at least 10 years in most cases, yeah, yeah. minimum. And even the ones who are really successful, I know have had a few setbacks along the way. So, you know, I also find out, I know a lot of people compare themselves to others and I always say, don't do that. Mm-hmm. And it took me a long time to learn that. Don't compare yourself to other people because everybody's in a different journey. What you do is you just make yourself that 0.1% better each day mm-hmm. because over time, that really does add up. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. And you know, I, you know, I've been around, but you know where I'm from, and I'm from, from the same time. So I know people that you know, and I've grown up not rich, and I know people whilst we weren't rich, were a million times less rich. Um, but I've also known people that probably could have bought Northern Ireland as a tax deduction, <laughs> right? Um, and what I've discovered is assholes and nice people, they exist in all of that. Mm-hmm. you've got to choose which one you are really don't you, you yeah know? a lot of people feel you have to be really aggressive and take advantage of people to be successful right and i strongly disagree with that i know a lot of successful people who give so much to charity they're very kind to their children and partners and they're just good people yeah but also a lot of successful people who are the most unpleasant obnoxious <laughs> and yeah people- horrible individuals that i avoid like the plague <laughs> yeah. so you get a mixture of both you can't just yeah. say you know, I know a lot of people who are poor, who have got the biggest hearts in the world. Right. Who do anything for anybody, and they're genuinely lovely. But I know a lot of poor people, I'm like, Jesus, I hope this person doesn't talk to me, because they're just not a nice individual. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I, locally, where I live now, I belong to a local leisure centre. And a lot of the people come in, in the guy's changing rooms, every second word is, F this, F this, F this. <laughs> You know, they're all trying to outmatch each other. Yeah. Oh, look yeah. at me. I'm a heterosexual. Watch me curse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they yeah. feel they have to outcurse yeah. each other. And I'm sitting there going, what's wrong with you guys? You know, you don't yeah. have this to yeah. be respected, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I totally do. Um, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I've had this argument, debate, or not argument, this debate with quite a few people quite often. Um, and even lawyers, you know, people say, oh, you Rottweiler. And yeah, I am a Rottweiler. I will come for your soul if I have to come for your soul. <laughs> but I think you catch more bees with honey than vinegar, right? Um, so I think, you know, you've got, you've got to deploy those skills whenever you've got to deploy those skills. But um, if you were giving, so let's say I'm 16, right? I have no limitations. I have no insecurities. The world is my oyster. And actually whatever advice you give me can actually be implicated. And I come to you and I say, Naraj, the most important thing for me in this life for me will be to be able to sit in a nice big house with a nice car and a really nice big lifestyle. Um, how do I get there? Well, the first thing I would say to that person, because I've lived that life, Mm-hmm. And it took me to the age of 39 to find success in life and the age of 43 to have the big house in the country and the beautiful sports car. Right. Already perceived to be an exceptionally wealthy life. Again, not wealthy, millionaire wealthy, but the house is now worth almost a million pound. Mm-hmm. That, that to me is wealthy. Yeah. Um, what, how do I do that? The first question I always ask is, why do you want to achieve that? Mm. And quite often young people unfortunately believe 
that if they have tremendous wealth in life, it automatically leads to happiness. And that is a, one of the biggest fallacies young people have. You know, I've been into schools quite a bit, but once or twice a year I'll go in and people will ask me to talk about careers. Right. Uh, girls, let, let's say 13 to 14 years old are quite sensible in their career choices. Almost every single boy wants to be a gamer, right. a footballer, or a movie star, or a rapper. And I say, well, why is that? And almost every single person without exception says, I want to be famous and rich. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like, okay, why? Make me happy. And that's completely the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. But of course, they're too young to realize that. You know, right. We know better. Yeah. Your teens and early 20s, you don't know better. I want to be the first Indian Bon Jovi because I believe I was rich and successful. People would love me. You're not uh, Jet Mirage. There's time. There's time. <laughs> so if a young kid says they want to be successful in a big house, my first thing, I wouldn't give them any advice. I would say, why is that? Mm. And what do you think you'll achieve in life when you have money? And... What about your friendships? What about your loved ones? I would ask them, that's what a good coach does. A good coach doesn't say, do this, do this, do this. That's not, that's not coaching. It's telling somebody what to do. Right. What I spend a lot of time doing with people as a coach is I ask really deep questions that really make them think hmm. because that's what you should do. And if you spend more time asking questions to people and giving them time to think rather than saying, do this, do that, I think a lot of people in life, Anthony, would have better outcomes. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, I mean, I've lived a life where fo my focus has always been kind of my career. And that was part of my TED talk was realizing that actually, if I'm defined only by my career and it can be taken away, mm -hmm. then so can all of I, all of me can go as well. Um, and that, that was a real kind of breakthrough moment for me. Um, but then kind of on the flip side of that, it's almost like I'm preparing TED talk part two. Um, was then re-accepting that actually much as I'm not only defined by my job or what I do, I actually really like that it is a big part of me. And I, I like, I am, you know, that drive, that what makes me feel a bit taller today is a success within my work mostly. Um, it, it's what makes me tick. Um, so, but what sort of questions then should, should somebody like me be asking myself to, if I'm thinking, I want to get to the next level of, of kind of, I've cornered all of this and I've kind of got this little part of the market sorted and I, I now want to go next. What should I be asking myself? I would certainly ask yourself, why do you want to go there? Mm. Um, what skills do I need to learn to mm. get there? How do I invest in myself to get there? Is there anybody in the law firm I can get mentored from? Mm -hmm. or even outside the law firm I can learn from. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, how much money do I have to pay them <laughs> to teach yeah. me? Because, yeah. you know, I, I ask people for advice and sometimes people are very good at giving me advice and sometimes yeah. they don't. And, I, and as soon as I say, how much do I have to pay? People's attitudes change very quickly. <laughs> they do. Right. Um, yeah. So why do you want to get to this level? And what skills do you think you'll have to learn in order to get there? Yeah, good questions, good questions. I like that. Actually, I've just landed in my, an amazing mentor, by the way. Um, well, but yeah, but yeah, they, they are, they are great questions. And actually, I just want to tap onto that mentor thing, because I've actually been talking to a friend of mine um, who does quite okay in business, but, you know, could do with a bit, bit, bit of mentoring, I think. Um, and I kind of broached the subject with him recently. Um, and I could almost see him kind of cringe, like, the thoughts of this idea that somebody would come along and tell him what to do or tell him what he needs to do. Um, and, I, and I was saying to him, I truly don't know anybody who's hit their full potential without having mentors in their life. Yeah, I, I, I really don't. Do you? Do you? I, I truly don't know anybody that has. The only people I know who are successful at mentors are people who married into money. Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody else I know, I don't know anybody who's naturally brilliant. Everybody knows how to develop it over the years. Yeah. I always say to somebody, if you don't invest in yourself, why would anybody invest in you? Absolutely. I still have a coach once a month that I work with. Yeah. I still have a speaking coach I work with every quarter when I speak at events and conferences. Sure. You have to keep your skills sharp. It's so important to keep learning. Now, this is one of the libraries. I've got three bookshelves. Yeah. One of my partner's house, one of my parents' house. And one of my my bedroom, three bookshelves, and I read a book a week. I study. I spend one hour a day reading, and then two hours Saturday, three hours Sunday. All my books are highlighted in pens with ridiculous pink highlights. Because yeah. 
I, I look at the really good ones, like once yeah. you reread the best ones. Yeah. Because that is how you, st I have to stay on top of my game to help people. Yeah. I do. Absolutely. Yeah, and you really do. And, you know, this idea that, that you know, we're all, you know, we, we, I did it myself, but I did it my way. Yes, you did. But yeah. Frank Sinatra also had a band. <laughs> he, he had a band, he was very smart. He had great friends in a rap pack. He was known for generosity. He fought against racism. You know, he was one of the first people to hire Quincy Jones. Yeah, yeah. And Quincy Jones has been very open about that. And Frank Sinatra, I've seen him do interviews about how he hated racism. He was, he was a great man for all the flaws he had and the womanizing he did. He was a great man who gave so many people opportunities. I'm a big fan of Frank Sinatra, even though I don't listen to his music. Yeah. Cheesy 80s music. I love cheesy 80s music, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Sinatra was still amazing. I still recognize that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's that idea, you know, you, we, we, we don't, we're not islands. We, we, we've got to, we've got to utilize people and, you know, not ask, it's not even about asking for help. Just, just, just be around people and take, Take some lead and take some guidance whenever whatever role is, is meant to happen. Um, but I just want to go to the next part of the book, which I think kind of brings us towards the end of the chat, which I think is quite lovely. Um, and it's all about having um, met this lovely girl with, couldn't have more of a, an Irish name, Orla. Um, <laughs> so two weeks later, Orla met my family. She was a vegetarian, worked for the NHS and respected her elders. So she practically was Indian. <laughs> <laughs> They adored her and I was welcomed into our house as one of her own. A few days later, I announced on LinkedIn that I had met somebody and after all that pain, suffering, loneliness and setbacks, bad luck, disappointments, I had found true love. Mm. The post went viral. It reached one million views with thousands of private messages of congratulations and support. I felt like I had accomplished something truly amazing. It wasn't an award or a big commission check or a pay rise. It was something way more important. 12 months later, Orly and I moved in together, celebrated our first anniversary and are living happily ever after. And I love that. And that's what I would be reading to that 16 year old, I think. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much. I think that's that's really, really, really nice. Miraj, thank you so much for joining me. It's been gorgeous. How do we follow you? How do we send everybody to come and litter you with lots of questions that I haven't asked? <laughs> <laughs> if you're on LinkedIn, please send me a personalized invite. Uh, if you're not on LinkedIn, just go to everybodyworksinsales.com and uh, you can message me there. Gorgeous. Miraj, thanks so much. Please come back and chat again soon. All the very best to you. Take care. Thank you so, so much, Anthony. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>